I'm Megan O'Sullivan. I am the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University and a professor at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. It's my pleasure to be moderating our panel today on the economic dilemma in the Middle East and North Africa, reforming and uncertainty. And of course, um, this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, for a wide variety of reasons. For those of us who've worked on the Middle East or lived in the Middle East, we often spend a lot of time explaining to people it's a very diverse region, you know, culturally, ethnically, demographically, and this is certainly also true when it comes to economics. We have countries with very different resource endowments. We have countries with very different demographics to Egypt with 100, more than 100 million people, to Qatar with just a few hundred thousand Qataris. Uh, we have very big differences in economic structures and debt capacity, um, infrastructure. There's a lot of variety in the region when it comes to economics as well as to politics and culture. Um, we're going to tease out some of these differences and the differences in economic opportunities and challenges and trajectories in the region today. And we'll do so cognizant of big changes in the global economy as a whole that are influencing the Middle East. So we think about um, the shift from integration to deglobalization, all obviously impacting the region. We think about the shift from fossil fuels to clean energy, the decarbonization push that's happening globally, obviously having big implications for Middle Eastern economies. And we think about the political fragmentation that we see uh, around the world, which of course is having an impact on the Middle East. And we will, of course, touch on the renewed conflict in parts of the region and how that might be shaping economic trajectories. So we have a fantastic, very high level group to discuss all of these things. I'd like to introduce them. I'll just go down in this direction. Um, sitting directly to my, my right is Minister Faisal Al Ibrahim, who's the Minister of Economy and Planning of Saudi Arabia. Moving uh, down, there's Nadia Fatah Alawi, who is the Minister of Economy and Finance of Morocco. Sitting next to her is Minister Rania Al Mashat, who is the Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt. Uh, moving down is Mr. Hussein Sawani, who's the chairman of uh, Damak International, which is a global property uh, developer. Moving along, we have uh, Mazen Dar Darwaze, who is the executive vice chairman and the president of Middle East and North Africa for Hikma Pharmaceuticals of Jordan. And then finally, we have Mr. Halfan Bahul, who's the CEO of the Dubai Future Foundation. So I thought I'd begin the conversation. We're going to talk uh, among the, the panel for 30 minutes or so, and then we will open for questions. I thought I would uh, begin with you, Faisal. Uh, a real softball setting the stage for us. We're at the beginning of 2024 in the face of everything that I described. What do you see as the economic outlook for the region? What do you think of as the biggest constraints on growth and, and the opportunities? Sure, thank you very much, Megan. I'll, I'll start maybe by saying that the Middle East is, um, or MENA, is more integrated in the global economy than it ever was before. And what affects the global economy affects MENA, and vice versa. What affects the MENA region also affects the global economy. Uh, that said, and despite this being a very challenging time in the region, I think uh, we need to seize the opportunity of uncertainty to move towards more reform and more transformation not only because uh, it is necessary, because times are dire, but also because this is a good time. It is possible, and sometimes more possible when there are challenges than when you're in a steady state. Um, if you look at the Middle East, you'll see two groups of countries, ones that are transforming and ones that are having a little more challenges. I think both countries need to continue, both groups of countries need to continue working on what they have at hand. I think the countries that are transforming need to continue with their transformation. Their strength helps the strength of the MENA region uh, and, and, and vice versa. I think the, the other group needs to also uh, look at how it can kick off reform and get support from uh, its neighboring countries. Uh, if, you look, if you look at um, uh, GDP for 2024, I think the forecast is around 3.4% for the Middle East. And, and that's a bit of a jump from where we were before. And I think the opportunities are still aplenty. If you look at this region, 
it's still not one of the most integrated regions in of itself, and there's room for more improvement uh, there. The region is one of the youngest in the world, and also it sits at the center of the world, connecting and being in three major uh, continents, uh, especially in a world where we see some fragmentation, uh, uh, but also some opportunities to pivot towards a, a new version of what we're used to and even opportunities to co-author the future of the global economy and play a big role in it. Um, uh, you know, there are also natural resources that need to be utilized and invested in, in a proper way. And I think if we, if we just look at uh, the opportunities ahead and if we try to look positively on uh, 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 these opportunities uh, and work together uh, and continue to be steadfast in what we know uh, needs to be done and what is right and continually think long term, we'll in, be in a better position. This region has always been resilient. It's always faced challenges and it's always, uh, it always uh, came out of these challenges in a better uh, a version of itself. Great, thank you very much. Um, Hussein, maybe I'll ask you the same question, but from the perspective of the private sector, uh, a global property developer, as I mentioned, when you look at the economic outlook for the region, what are you most focused on? Do you share the assessment that this is a, a moment of opportunity? Uh, I have some different views where I don't think the region is very same. So there are countries which are growing very fast, their economies are solid, <laughs> their currency is solid, and they're doing miracles like UAE and Saudi Arabia. There are countries who have challenges, and there are countries who have war like Yemen, you know. So you can't say the region is the same. Uh, so every country is very different, you know. And even in GCC, every country is different, you know. Uh, Qatar has gone through tremendous growth in the last 20 years, but after the football game and all that, there is maybe a little bit of oversupply from the property point of view, you know. Uh, even though it's a very good economy, I know the country for 40 years, we're doing a business, has a good future, but for the coming two years, it has some oversupply in, in, in the property side. So every country is different. We as a company, as a business, we look where the opportunity is, of course, and today we see great opportunity in Saudi Arabia, a part, of course, from our hometown, Dubai, is, is, is booming, okay? But those are the two areas that we're gonna focus on going forward. Great, thank you for that. Rania, could I turn to you and uh, just ask you about debt? Because debt um, is often a constraint for, for many countries in the region. It shrinkens the fiscal space that countries have to devote to other priorities, socioeconomic priorities, um, climate, transition, all of those things. Could you speak to that from the Egyptian perspective and, and how, how big an issue that is for Egypt, particularly right now? Let me put it a little bit in a global context because I think if you read any of the um, uh, you know, economic outlooks or analysis, uh, be it from uh, the IFIs or research uh, uh, institutions, you'll find that uh, since uh, 2022, on the backdrop uh, of the geopolitical issues in Europe, uh, the flight of capital out of emerging markets was quite steep. Um, and that comes on the back of uh, the developed world fighting inflation due to food price increases and fuel price increases. Uh, and that has really created um, uh, a shift in the dynamic when it comes to cost of financing uh, for uh, emerging and developing countries uh, that have, uh, you know, prior to 2022, trying to navigate a, a green transition when it comes to um, uh, their climate uh, sort of uh, objectives and ambitions, uh, and also trying to diversify their economies to be able to attract the capital uh, that can absorb, uh, as uh, my colleague Faisal mentioned, uh, the, the, the demographic which need uh, jobs and so forth. So there have been uh, hiccups and sands in the wheels, if you will, in this uh, uh, over the past uh, few years. Uh, and this has been highlighted uh, in different uh, uh, you know, discussions if we're talking about the World Bank evolution uh, uh, and uh, with uh, my colleague Nadia, we are both governors there, and, and this is centerpiece. What do uh, uh, multilateral development banks, uh, what can uh, the private sector, along with uh, government policies, uh, try and create a conducive uh, a platform for de-risking some of the uh, private investments in countries which need it the most? I think um, um, a focus on the medium to long term is extremely important uh, because uh, different countries 
uh, still have uh, the potential and the resources, as was just highlighted, uh, to provide uh, uh, very good and plugged in input to the global uh, economy, which is much needed across the board. Um, and therefore, uh, working together in, in the spirit of Davos, when we say multilateral, sorry, multi-stakeholder engagement uh, becomes extremely important. If I can speak on uh, some of the uh, ways forward when it comes to debt, several initiatives uh, taking place uh, in the African continent uh, out of the different uh, COP uh, um, uh, discussions, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, debt swaps for climate, uh, which again, uh, creates more of that fiscal space uh, that you spoke about. Uh, and the green transition is important for all of us uh, because of uh, the jobs it creates and also because uh, of the different ambitions that, uh, that we have. Um, uh, so that's maybe the, the, you know, how I would like to put the overall uh, framework uh, of where we do stand uh, with respect to the global developments um, uh, with that uh, particular point that you brought up. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Masan, if I could move to you, build on um, what we just heard about the importance of the private sector working with the government, the, pri the public sector in unlocking potential. So when you think about the reforms that you are looking for, that you think are most needed in Jordan and the region more generally, how would you present them? How would you characterize the reforms that you're most eager to see? Uh, when you start reform, you, you start with the stakeholders. 50% of the population of the Arab world is below 30 years. Uh, today, women empowerment in the Arab world and the workforce is less than 30%. So the potential upside is much more uh, huge in terms of having those capacities in the workforce. This is number one. Number two, music to my ears, what His Excellency said about opening uh, trade in the Arab world and having more cooperation. We've been uh, preaching about that since 1965. In 1965, the Arab League signed an agreement to open the markets for pharmaceuticals and have a unified registration. Today, we're in 2024, and still this hasn't happened. The pharma market, I'm, I'm going to talk from the perspective of the pharma market. Uh, the pharma market, the whole total pharma market of the Middle East is 3% dollar value of the global market. So money spent on healthcare in the Arab world is still minimal. We have countries that spend $12 and $15 on per, per person, and countries in the Gulf and Saudi that go up to 800 or 900 or 200, depending on the country. Why, You're talking about the US, it's a 42% dollar market where you have social network, Japan is the same. So where is it that we need reform in the Arab world? We need, first of all, to have the basic infrastructure of healthcare redefined, and many countries started doing that, and I see it in the plans that I, I witnessed in several countries. But then again, when you talk about reform, you're talking about uh, opening uh, trade barriers, you're opening uh, monetary systems, you're talking about governance. This is something that really scares me in the Arab world. Many countries are taking very bold steps towards governance, but some countries are becoming more protective and closing their markets. So the paradox here is how are we going to be able to deal with that? But I'm very optimistic about the Middle East. I see a great opportunity. For example, now uh, we're, try we're trying to bring all of our back office business from the US to the Arab world, having our hub of R&D in the Arab world. We're exporting today from Saudi Arabia, from Jordan to the US and Europe. And I think we can have low cost manufacturing sites in the MENA region whereby we can employ more people and get them more engaged. But this has to be a multi-stakeholder. All of us have to work together on that. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, build on another thing that, that uh, Nadia touched on, or Nadia, Nadia um, I'm going to you, Nadia, is uh, the issue of climate change and how it's affecting the countries um, in the region. And you're coming from Morocco, of course. Um, and Morocco has this unique uh, characteristic that it is connected energy-wise to Europe, which is, of course, pushing ahead with its energy transition very aggressively. How is climate change affecting the, the prospects for economic growth in Morocco, in North Africa, generally speaking? Mm. No, I, I don't know if there is anyone all over the world that is still skeptical about the effects of climate change everywhere, and uh, Morocco Come is... Come to America. <laughs> <laughs> but in Morocco, it's uh, definitely a priority to tackle the effects of the climate change and take it as an opportunity. Maybe I can touch on two or three uh, points. First, water. 
We were, I would say, in previous years, dealing with the drought, years of drought and action plan for the drought. Today we changed completely the mindset and said that the base case is the scarcity of water. And therefore we have a full, pla a full plan for many measures for 20, period 20 to 27, we're talking about $15 billion. We had some delay because of COVID. The choice is desalination. Objective 27, 50% of the drinking water would be from desalination. Less pressure on agriculture. I will be back to agriculture. Also keep uh, uh, building dams. We also have launched a very, I would say, interesting project the northern region of Morocco had, I would say, excess of water. So for the first time, we built a highway of water going from the north to the south. So uh, water, a huge priority from the leadership of our country to every single Moroccan citizens. We started with the offer, and then we increase in awareness for the, the consumer. We think about agriculture, but Industry, tourism, renewable energy, everyone is consuming this water. We need it. We need to provide for it, but I would say in a sustainable way. On agriculture, Morocco has also done, uh, I would say, really important uh, uh, progress when, when it comes to this climate change. Uh, a year of drought like the one we have in 22, three decades from now, it would have uh, caused a decrease by 40% in the added value on the agri uh, sector. And because of all the strategies, because of we are using technology innovation, unfortunately, the added value decreased by 13%, which caused a two, two, two points of growth in GDP. But 13% is much better than 40%. And we will still use innovation technology to do a better and diversification of the, port, the, the economy have allowed for this. On another topic is the renewable energies. We, are, we have a plan committed by, 20, uh, by 2030 to have 50% of the capacity of uh, our energy uh, uh, coming from the renewable uh, energies, wind, solar. Uh, so we are now increasing the pace of the investment. We have made the choice to invite the private sector to come to invest uh, in the PPP's forma or direct private sector. So just to uh, talk about reform and the governance, I think that the, the public sector should be regulating, easing the life of the investors, giving the um, long-term visibility, because I think uh, investors like to be, I would say, having the comfort and the trust on the, on the vis visibility. Maybe one point on climate change, and just to echo what my, Rania, my colleague, was saying, is that what we are facing now is that we are committed to have a green, sustainable growth. We are facing challenges of climate change, and we are not getting the financing that is needed. So we will keep advocating for additional money to, to, to transition. We know that we never get, but we'll try keeping all that money. But, uh, but at least we should have cheapest money for... Uh, so in some cases, you have incentive of, uh, I would say, a, a rebate of 20 basis points for a huge commitment for all the industries and the Moroccan citizens. I said, no, this is unfair. We are committed, we are doing our part of the job. We need to think about how to finance this climate transition for all the region and for all the world. Thank you for bringing that in. That certainly has been one of the big topics of conversation when we think about the energy transition affecting so many countries um, in Africa, in the Middle East and beyond. Um, Halfan, I'd like to come to you, and actually one of the bright spots that we think about in the Middle East when it comes to economics is a growing class of entrepreneurs. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, what needs to be done. Of course, we're talking about reform. What needs to be done to um, help make the ecosystem more conducive to entrepreneurs and the growth of the private sector? Thank you, Megan. First of all, I'd like to say I'm, I'm honored to be with the esteemed panelists here. Honored to be here with you all. And I think, I mean, many of the buzzwords have been mentioned through, uh, through my fellow panelists. And I think, I mean, um, if I go back a bit before talking about entrepreneurship, um, if we go back for the past maybe four or five years or even before, I think the world has been sending us 
so many signs and curveballs across uh, geopolitical conflicts or economical conflicts or even opportunities when it comes to the digital economy and the value of digital economy. Or even if you look at the uh, pandemic, for example, those are all big signs that have one common denominator. And it, and it is the only way forward to resolve all those is really to um, have conversations and unite at a global level. And this is no difference when it comes to the uh, MENA region. Um, there's uh, obviously, um, His Excellency the Minister has mentioned um, uh, so many points regarding the, the opportunities, um, the talent, the young population, 50% in comparison to the OECD countries, which is at 36%. The sovereign uh, 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 capital and assets that are worth north of 3.1 trillion as well, that's available for funding. So um, the uh, opportunities are there. The, um, the stories, the success stories are happening. You hear um, exits when it comes to entrepreneurs. You hear uh, the valuations. And, and, and I'd say in certain countries, I agree, uh, certain countries in MENA are maybe doing better than others when it comes to success stories, when it comes to growing those businesses. But I think uh, this is the good news, that there's more investment in, in venture, even though there was maybe a bit of a drop in the past year, but that was a, a global drop in, 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 uh, in uh, funding uh, innovation entrepreneurship, which also had a ripple effect on the region, which is, which is normal. But I think in order for those success stories, and going back to the uh, minister's comment, um, in order for all those stories to really grow in the region, there needs to be a unified uh, growth success story when it comes to policy. Those businesses back in the days used to look at their population that surrounded them to grow. Nowadays, uh, an innovator or a startup with a click of a button, the world becomes uh, their market. So how can we uh, replicate those stories that happen in UAE or happen in Saudi to happen throughout the MENA region through seamless, borderless, policies that are friendly for entrepreneurs. And I think this is the key uh, success factor in the upcoming um, 10 or 20 years. If you look at the impact on economies when it comes to uh, the uh, AI and now the Gen AI, they're talking about north of 5 trillion by 2030. Same when it comes to the whole digital economy, including the metaverse. But this is impossible if we do not replicate those stories across and create seamless growth because 10 million population in the UAE isn't enough, nor is it the population of Saudi Arabia, it's the whole MENA region. And I think for those of you that talk about competition between countries within the uh, Middle East is mistaken, because, if you, because this is uh, complementary, this is synergistic, this is supporting the wider ecosystem. And if we create that right cross-border, uh, agile policy and replicate it across the MENA region, the MENA region will be the hottest test bed for innovation, inshallah. Thank you very much. Maybe um, can I make an intervention sure. before? Um, uh, just because uh, uh, you know, climate was mentioned, so I, I want to uh, just uh, follow up on uh, uh, what uh, Minister Nadia mentioned. Um, and this is also uh, you know, one of the outcomes of uh, COP28 and the joint statement from the multilateral development banks who provide the concessional finance. And there, there was a, a very important emphasis uh, on country ownership and country platforms to be able to put together the desalination projects, the energy transition projects, renewables, uh, uh, food security, agriculture, and so forth. And I just want to mention here that uh, country platforms are a way to also invite private investments when there are clear uh, uh, projects identified uh, by the government, but also uh, the space for public-private partnerships. And I just want to uh, underscore uh, Egypt's country platform, the nexus of water, food, and energy, NWFE. It's pronounced in Arabic, Nuwafi, which means fulfilling pledges. Uh, and that's because COP27 was from pledges to implementation. And the idea uh, is to have commitment with respect to the uh, nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, translate those into uh, projects which are well identified, and then uh, have credibility with the MDBs and so forth to be able to bring in the private sector. We have several uh, uh, companies from the Gulf working with us uh, in our renewable energy space because of the ambition to uh, add to the bin band solar plant that we had in 2014 and put extra capacities uh, uh, going forward. Also water desalination, water is scarce uh, uh, in Egypt particularly, mm -hmm. and water desalination is the next uh, big investment for private sector to come in. And then finally food security with everything that's happening with agriculture and just bringing in entrepreneurship because the solutions for climate action also lies in the 
technology and in innovation, which a lot of the youth in the Middle East and in our countries are actually providing and being part of the solution. Great. Thank you very much, Rania. Um, Faisal, I'd like to come back to you and, and uh, ask about Vision 2030. So you talked about countries at the beginning. You said countries that have already embarked on a program of reform. And Saudi Arabia is clearly in that category, having uh, undertaken a, a wide variety of reforms. I actually, many years ago, I was in Saudi Arabia, and I had someone say to me that Vision 2030 was an, a revolution in disguise of an economic reform program. And certainly, we have seen so many changes in Saudi Arabia in recent years. But I want to ask you about um, the break-even price. When it comes to oil, we often hear that Saudi Arabia is interested in keeping, say, a $90 price for oil globally in order to ensure that it can execute the many components of this ambitious Vision 2030 strategy. Could you comment on the strategy? How is it going? We're actually getting closer and closer to 2030. Um, and for how long do you think that Saudi Arabia will need to have a certain high price of oil in order to ensure that it is able to implement its internal domestic reforms? Sure. So I can't comment on price. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think if you ask this question to any Saudi, they'll give you the same answer. Um, and anyone who understands the true dynamics of energy markets and oil markets will also say that Saudi and its partners are uh, solving for long-term uh, stability of the market. Um, and that's what we've always done. And, and sometimes production cu cuts are necessary for us to get there. Uh, and we don't want to be in a period where there isn't enough investments and then we end up in a shortage and end up in uh, uh, at a time where uh, we have to use uh, forms of energy that are very uh, dirty and, and painful to the environment. And we live in a very high stress in terms of uh, uh, heat and drought uh, uh, area of the world. And we are the first people who will be affected by uh, any lack of success on that agenda. But as far as the vision goes, Vision 2030 is an evolution, uh, a, a transformation that is uh, really taking us to where we want to be as an economy and society. Uh, we are at the midpoint. Since 2016, the Saudi's economy without oil has grown 20 percent, and that's uh, faster than the EU and, and the US, which is at 10 and 14 percent. Um, uh, in 22, we recorded the fastest growth in terms of the G20 countries at 8.7%. Uh, the non-oil activities grew at 5.9%. Uh, and since then, every quarter, we are seeing the same momentum around 5, 6, more recently a little less because the levels in 22 were very high uh, towards the end of 22. But we're witnessing more economic activity coming from new sectors. In the first half of 23, that was tourism. It grew at 130 uh, percent over the year uh, or year over year. Um, uh, and we forecast that in, in 24, we'll have a total growth of 4.4 and non-oil growth between 4.4, 4.5 and 5 uh, percent. Uh, the momentum is continuing. The transformation is continuing. But we need to keep in mind that every transformation is a grueling process. Uh, and every transformation requires long-term thinking. And it's not easy to you know, work together and adopt a long-term view. Otherwise, we wouldn't have most of the problems or the challenges we have today. So it's important to uh, continue thinking long-term, continue delivering day in, day out, consistently, uh, uh, with a boldness and, uh, and a view to collaborate with the world, but also back to the lack of economic uh, integration in the region, the opportunity to improve it. We need to also double down on that as a region. We in the GCC have been working towards that more uh, firmly in the recent years. We recently signed two FTAs as a GCC and will continue to do so. And there's always a bright spot in the Middle East, even if there's challenges. More recently, I'd like to uh, you know, note the, the growth in VC funding in Saudi Arabia, which was the highest in MENA. And we were not, nowhere near the first uh, five or six uh, five or ten years ago. So whatever there's a challenge, there's another opportunity in this region. And I think the more economically integrated it is, the better. His Royal Highness said this in one of the FII's in Riyadh. He said, uh, uh, soon the Middle East will become the new Europe. And I believe he meant in terms of economic integration. And we still have an opportunity to achieve that. 
Thank you. Um, Rania, I'd like to address this question to you, but it's really for the, the whole panel. Um, obviously, one of the, the foci of this uh, World Economic Forum has been the increase in conflict around the world, and we've seen uh, a tragic uh, a tragic conflict unfolding in, in Gaza and with real risks for escalation to the region as a whole. Egypt, of course, is probably one of the countries that is most affected by this economically and stands the risk of being even more um, economically impact, impacted. Could you say a bit about how the conflict and the risks of further instability is affecting the economic outlook? And I welcome comments from any panelists on this. Well, uh, we've been here for several days, and, and really the, the, the discussion on, uh, on what's happening in the Middle East is, is uh, discussed in closed doors and also in panels. Uh, it's a very urgent situation, and um, I think everybody uh, today is with the realization that we need a permanent solution so that uh, uh, you know, people are protected, and also the, uh, the economics of conflict are as much as possible mitigated because of this possible spillover effects that we are seeing, uh, we are seeing today. Uh, of course, um, uh, you know, Egypt uh, has taken on the Palestinian cause for many, many years. Um, and uh, most recently, the humanitarian aid that has been uh, flowing from uh, Rafah, uh, uh, how the world has been bringing this humanitarian aid, but how on the logistics side, uh, and also the hospitals in Egypt being open for the casualties from uh, uh, Palestine, but also uh, the What's happening with uh, the Red Sea is, is, is quite uh, uh, urgent. It's quite uh, important. We were just coming out of supply chain disruptions uh, from COVID, uh, the, the, the soft landing that everybody uh, uh, you know, has been expecting with, with interest rates uh, uh, tightening, sort of moderating. All of this is uh, you know, being challenged now uh, uh, with an exogenous shock that was not expected at all. So any of the forecasts that were done um, uh, just a few months ago are just tipping uh, the exact uh, size, extent, duration uh, is uh, anybody's guess. And that's why uh, the political uh, solution is very, very important so that uh, the economic uh, uh, outturn uh, is one uh, that does not create uh, even more sufferings when it comes to uh, unemployment, uncertainty. Uh, and again, uh, the theme of this Davos is trust. And I think that is uh, one commodity uh, I know Faisal didn't want to comment on the price of oil, but also uh, trust has a price, and, and, and that is a price that all of us need to work together uh, to, be able, uh, to be able to maintain. Also, private sector, with this uncertainty, uh, is going to uh, you know, be more challenged, uh, and also the cost of financing is going to be more challenged. So it's just an exacerbation of uh, shock on top of shock, uh, and therefore um, uh, uh, we count on uh, political leadership uh, uh, and, uh, you know, collaboration to be able to find a sustainable solution, uh, which is uh, extremely, extremely pivotal and important at this stage. Thank you, Rania. Mazen, you indicated you'd like to yeah, comment on this, the, and then I'll turn to the audience um, for some questions. This is a very critical path now in the Middle East, yeah, especially with the Gaza war and the genocide that's being committed. And trust is something very important, like we said. So there must be a global trust on how we can handle this. I've had several discussions with many business leaders from different parts of the Arab world and Israel. And there is a, a lack of fear today of trust. This is what we have to address. I'll, I'll give you a very good example. Uh, and uh, the other day, uh, Her Excellency spoke about refugees, for example, in Egypt, it's 9 million today you have, versus a population of 100 million. In Jordan today, we have 3 million on a population of 8 million. So every dollar we spend on our economy, 30% goes to subsidizing non-Jordanian actual. And this is becoming more scary if we have an outflux from uh, the government, I mean, from the Gaza war, especially into Egypt and Jordan, that will be a, also a disaster situation. Now, both countries have said this will not be accepted, but in reality, it's happening. In reality, there are people that are being displaced today coming to these parts and in order just to have a secure life. So. There should be trust, there should be cooperation, there should be a global commitment on how we can address these issues as we go forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, I'd like to turn uh, to the audience. So I think there is a, a microphone. Um, if you could just stand up and uh, identify yourself and direct your question to one of our panelists, that would be great. 
John Shipman, two quick questions. Uh, Executive Chairman of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Uh, to Minister Feta Alawi, you look north, but you also uh, look south. And uh, I wonder if you could say a few words about the importance of migrant labor from sub-Saharan Africa into Morocco and how you've been able to ensure that, that migrant labor doesn't perhaps cause some of the social problems that uh, we have in Europe. And to Minister <coughs> al Masat, I would like to give you the opportunity to say a few words about uh, the role of the Egyptian army in the domestic uh, economy in Egypt, because whenever I speak to people who are interested in potentially investing uh, in Egypt, that's the first question that comes up. Do I really have to engage with the army? How big a role do they have uh, in uh, the Egyptian economy? Can say, you say a few words, but the best answer is to that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Nadia. Um, on the, on the sub-Saharan, I would say, in, uh, uh, cooperation of Morocco, I think uh, just to mention it is in the DNA of Morocco to be uh, really uh, working for the South-South cooperation. Morocco is the second foreign investment, a foreign investment in Africa in many areas now today. But as everyone knows, this youth uh, dividend, the demographic dividend, actually is not happening yet because there is a lot of challenges and a lot of them try to cross the Mediterranean through Morocco. So we, uh, we, we, we work closely with the, with the European Union to find short-term but also mid- and long-term solution. We commit also to help by investing first in the countries, despite the fact that uh, our resources are limited, but we strongly believe that we need to invest locally, train locally, finance locally as a solution. We also train a lot of young African in Morocco. We have almost 15,000 uh, of them yearly. We pay the scholarship of almost 20% on, I would say, our own bu budget. Uh, because we, uh, we want to offer them, uh, I would say, education and uh, uh, give them incentive to go back uh, home to create this. Uh, we are not, I would say, uh, we are not tempted by this brain uh, drains. But since you're giving me this opportunity, I am uh, telling our partners that also struggling with this migration that no one uh, can stop now, that we need our talent, we need our brain. A, a government like Morocco spends 6% of the GDP of educating people. So when you have IT engineers, doctors, they're getting visas in two weeks because someone needs them in, uh, in, uh, in the north. When you have an entrepreneur, not you, but a young entrepreneur that needs a visa to go buy some technology, or buy, get some financing, or just understand what's happening in the market, they will get his visa in nine months, 12 months, or never. So I think this migration is not just talking about borders, uh, being, uh, I would say, an excuse, an agenda for election outside time. I think each of us have a duty to come with solutions. Morocco is committed to this long-term vision but I think that we need our youth to be educated. We need our entrepreneur to be confident and to have their part of, I would say, the global growth. Great, thank you. Um, maybe on, on that question, the uh, role of state has been discussed extensively over the past uh, two years. Uh, the government came out with a state ownership uh, uh, policy paper which identifies uh, the sectors that, uh, you know, will continue to have some sort of uh, um, uh, participation and then the ones that uh, are going to be open. So uh, that is published, that there's a, there's a uh, framework on how to move there. Uh, being the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the minister who deals with IFIs, uh, we, uh, in June of last year, um, um, have a strategic partnership with the IFC uh, to actually uh, work on an asset monetization program. So the first phase of that uh, was concluded a month ago uh, with um, a strategy on uh, which sectors uh, would be uh, open uh, uh, given the global circumstance uh, and of course all the uncertainty that we just talked because that also creates uh, additional pressure uh, on how to uh, move ahead with an asset monetization program. But let me give some statistics that despite all of this uh, and when we take a look at uh, the concessional finance that comes to the country, and this finance doesn't only come to the government, it also comes to the private sector. 
Uh, over the past uh, uh, four years, there's been $10 billion from multilateral development banks and, banks and bilateral uh, uh, partners that have been financing private sector in Egypt. IFC has one of its biggest private sector programs in the country. If I look at EBRD, if I look at EIB, uh, the uh, finance that they provide for private sector, and here it's not just Egyptian private sectors, also foreign uh, companies, uh, has been quite sizable in different sectors, uh, renewables being uh, a key one. Uh, uh, also, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, when we look at uh, um, uh, pharmaceuticals, so there have been uh, uh, quite uh, impressive uh, uh, investments, and when I say financing concessional, it's important because this is the uh, lower than market rates, and therefore uh, you, do, you, do, you do see uh, a very important uh, movement in that space, and I think uh, uh, going forward with the asset monetization program and the plans that the government has made public, uh, that is also going to be uh, quite important for us. Thank you. We have a question back, second to last row. Thank you so much. Do you want to stand up? Thank you so much, Thank Mina you. al editor of The National, based in Abu Dhabi. Um, I have a question for you, Your Excellency Khalfan. Um, you are CEO of the Future Foundation, the Way Future Foundation. So the idea of always thinking long term, which is difficult when we give when we look at all the difficulties we currently have in the region, especially with the devastating Gaza war. So when you're looking long term and you're thinking the future, what are two or things we should be thinking about when we look to the region, be they challenges or opportunities? Good to see you, first of all, and um, um, I think, yeah, I think, first of all, we need to keep an, an, an open mind, and I think um, when someone thinks about the Dubai Future Foundation, and to your point, people uh, ask us, what do you guys do? What's the Future Foundation doing? And the, the, the mandate is extremely agnostic, but I think, uh, to your point, um, the idea is just to, first of all, um, have an entity that's agile enough to understand what are the uh, global priorities and what are the things that matter most to humanity and going back to maybe to touch upon you know, the geopolitical conflicts and, and the topics you mentioned about Gaza if we as a world put humanity in the forefront it's easier said than done but everything can be resolved if we put any other interests uh, we set everything aside if we think of the human and what's in there for the betterment of humanity everything can be resolved and I think the Dubai Future Foundation does that we look at we focus on foresight we look at what is the most important thing for humanity and obviously the um, uh, the 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 major usual suspects of topics are always there whether it's climate whether it's how do we adopt ai how do we become more interconnected so if you ask me those are probably the top three but then it's all about what you do about them and uh, how do you deploy efforts, whether it's uh, capital or whether it's uh, resources, whether it's alignment when it comes to global uh, policies. All of the above needs to be done. Uh, there is sovereign capital uh, around the world, but, uh, and speaking maybe going back to maybe His Excellency the Minister's comment about the type of capital that needs to be deployed. Sovereign has asset allocation, has risk profiling, has return expectation, but you need that courageous kind of capital that will invest into those new ideas while accepting the risk that will come from those ideas. They are more patient, they'll have an impact on return, um, but they'll create uh, new sectors, they'll create new jobs. So and maybe this is a longer uh, uh, answer to your question, but I think the priorities are the sectors I mentioned. They are on top of the minds of everyone around the world, but it's all about what you do about them, whether it's funding or whether it's enabling or, or policy change. Uh, to ensure that everything is done, not in the betterment of one country, but in the betterment of humanity as a whole. Thank you for giving us a very good note upon which to end. We're at that time. I have to bring this to a close. We started the conversation talking about the many differences in the region, but I think our conversation actually focused on a lot of the commonalities, despite the very different situations and characters of the regional economies. We talked a lot about the imperative of climate, we talked a lot about the need for reform, the need for and the opportunity of greater integration, somewhat about the demographics and the demographic dividend that has yet to be fully seized in the Middle East, but certainly is there. And then, of course, perhaps most importantly, the need to find uh, a solution to uh, violence and war and conflict 
uh, in a way that provides a sustainable future and a secure future for Israelis and for Palestinians alike. Um, with that, I want to ask you to join me in thanking our guests here for a really interesting and insightful conversation.